I know I speak for all the members of fourth and seventh churches of Christ Scientist in Houston when I say that we're really glad you're here. And I think you'll be glad you came. When our speaker, Mark Swinney, was in first grade, he had a healing through prayer of a broken leg. His father had prayed for him and had just recently been introduced to Christian Science. And it was this initial healing that really sparked Mark's desire to devote his life to God. And he has a life of praying and healing and teaching and speaking on Christian Science. Mark learned early that age is not a barrier to accepting God's care. Whether we're in the first grade or whether we're closer to our 50th high school reunion. <laughs> I don't know if you saw it or not, but yesterday AARP published a study entitled The Aging of the Baby Boom and Growing Care Gap. And the essence of the article was that there's going to be a crisis, a shortage of caregivers for older people developing in 15 to 20 years. So tonight, Mark is going to help us pray about the challenges of aging. His topic is, could it be that God didn't intend for us to age? Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mark Swinney. Thank you so much, Don. You, you saw what a happy person Don is. You know, he talked about me being healed of a broken leg. He was healed of polio through prayer. And so uh, he's got a lot to smile about. I can see why. Well, if you've never been to one of these kinds of uh, events before, please feel very much at home. You may have driven by this building many times before. You might have wondered what happens in here. This is one of the things that happens. You saw the big banner there on the, uh, on the lawn. I had my picture on it, and I thought, well, I don't know how many people are going to come in the building, but you all did. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad. Yes, the church is sponsoring this lecture. They did such a wonderful job preparing everything. These flowers on both sides, I smell them. They're all real. They're just incredible really something. Well, you heard in the introduction that I am from New Mexico. Uh, have, have very many of you here ever been over to New Mexico? A few of you? A lot of you. All right. Do you ever drive over on Highway 10 uh, and then go visit that, uh, that tourist spot called Carlsbad Caverns? Did you ever see that one? <laughs> well, that has something to do with our lecture tonight, but I'm not going to tell you for a moment. You, you heard the title. It's Eternal Life. Could it be that God did not intend us to age? Now, I know that that is kind of an audacious question. Could it be that God didn't intend us to age? Every time I've ever spoken on this subject, I always have learned something new. And I know that will happen again tonight. I want to ask you... Um, I could give kind of the light version of this talk, or maybe the, the go for it version. Which one would you, would you like? <laughs> you want that? All right. I'll do that. All right, here comes Carl's Bad Caverns. The other day, <laughs> I was uh, reading about some scientists who are doing some studies down in Carl's Bad Caverns. It was interesting. They, um, they, we're down deep. These caverns are so deep that the tourists actually take an elevator all the way down, 600 feet to the bottom. These guys were in another part of the, um, of the caves, but uh, they were studying the layers of salt that had been laid down over the centuries. Now these layers of salt, they found in them these little pockets, little inclusions. In the pockets were these small little spores, little bacillus spores. Being scientists, they thought, well, let's see if we can do something with them. So they gave them some water and some light. 
And lo and behold, these little bacillus spores sprouted. They grew. Now, what's interesting, I read this, and I just was so surprised. I looked it up on the internet again afterwards. These little plants had waited there in the, in the layers of salt. They had waited there for 250 million years. That's, that's before the dinosaurs. First thing I thought to myself was, what if one of those bacillus spores, upon turning 65, had applied for Social Security? <laughs> How much would it have collected over 250 million years? Compared to one of those little plants, the human lifespan appears to go by in just an eye blink. And uh, I think that it's something we're going to really approach from a different perspective tonight. We're not going to really be looking at ourselves in terms of years, but I'll go into that. You know, sometimes you ever see this on TV, I'm sure it happens here, where someone will be featured on TV who is having his or her 100th or 105th birthday. You ever see that before? The other day I saw one, I'm not kidding you, I saw it on TV, maybe you saw it too, where uh, there was some a woman who was having that birthday, one of those birthdays, I don't know, and um, of course the reporter asked her, you know, what, what did it? How did, you, how did you live to 105? And she looked at him and she said, bacon. She has bacon, honestly, for every meal. And it showed her, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, bacon only. Well, we're going to go a little further than bacon. In order to in order really to get our handle on, a, on the start for this whole thing, I'm going to draw a lot on the Bible tonight. Now, in talking about God, right in the middle of the Bible, I've got some notes here, talking about God, it says that thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endure through all, throughout all generations. Talking about God, an everlasting kingdom. That word everlasting is key to our topic tonight, everlasting. You know, for God to be everlasting, God couldn't be physical even a little bit. Couldn't be physical even slightly. Anything that is material or physical never could be everlasting. I mean, you think about, oh, the tallest mountain on dry land here on earth, it's, it's Mount Everest. And one day it's all going to be sand on the beach. So it's not everlasting as big as it seems to be. It's not everlasting because it's made of matter. For something to be everlasting, it must be something non-material. And that is exactly the nature of God. The Bible describes God as love. And love has no boundaries. Love isn't physical. If love, divine love, that is God, were physical, there would be areas where God is and areas where God isn't. But no, God is everywhere present, ever present. The Bible describes God as spirit, as spirit. Now that is one of the words, the names for God, that helps me the most in understanding this nature of God. See, this love that is spirit is an intelligent presence. It's a presence that is only good. And it turns out it is the only real presence. You each, me too, we are the evidence of that presence. We are the expression, individualized, of this love that is spirit. Now, to be spiritual, to be spiritual, that's something I think people talk a lot about nowadays what it means to be spiritual. Spiritual, I think the world could take it more seriously. Spiritual, I want to go into this. Everyone here in the room, we've all done math problems. Do you remember when you were in school? We all did math problems, and we know that the products of math problems, math equations, are numbers. All right. Let's take the number four. The number four. I may write 
the symbol for it on a chalkboard, or I may have the number four on the back of my uniform, but that is only a symbol for an idea. An idea. That number four is a concept. Now, the number four, the idea, it is completely non-material, isn't it? And it's ever-present, too. There isn't some place, somewhere, where the idea of four does not exist. Now, did you ever in your life meet an old number four or a young number four? <laughs> no. Do you think there was ever a starting point for that number four? Do you think the other numbers ever got together and said, hey, we've got a new number, let's have a party, a birthday party? <laughs> of course not. No. That number four just is. It just is. Now, what makes the number four number four? It's the science of mathematics. Now, you and I are infinitely more than some number, and God is infinitely more than mathematics. But just as the science of math is behind what maintains the number four, it is this spirit that is love that is what maintains us as God's ideas. You wouldn't say the number four is spiritual, it's mental. Something that has its source in God is spiritual. God is spirit. You and I each are the offspring of God. And it's, it, it makes sense that we're spiritual because like produces like. This love that is ever-present, this spirit that is completely good, has a creation always that is spiritual, loving, and good. And that is what each one of us are. We do not have to earn that status. God loves us so much that we remain the spiritual creations of God. We represent the nature, the essence of God 24-7. Now I know that not everybody walks up to you on the street and says, oh, I had no idea. You're, you're completely spiritual. I didn't know that. That doesn't change what you are, though. The truth about you isn't true by vote. It just is. It's determined by God. Now, I'm going to tell you about a book that I read every day right along with my Bible. I've got a copy of it here. And this book is called Science and Health with key to the scriptures. I read it every day with my Bible. If you have a friend who brought you here to this, this lecture, a friend who sometimes maybe comes to this church, he or she might have told you about this book, Science and Health, and even the author, Mary Baker Eddy. She took the ideas we're gonna be discussing tonight about eternal life very seriously. And if you've read a little bit of this book, you know, that, you know that for sure. Now, she asked an interesting question about a third of the way through the book. She asked this question. She asks, can there be any birth or death for man, the spiritual image and likeness of God? Can there be any birth or death for man, the spiritual image and likeness of God? Now, if you were to talk with your friends, talk with your friends, and you ask your friends about death, about death, probably most of your friends would say something like, well, I don't think that death is the end of everything. I think we go on after death. I think most of your, most of your friends would say something along those lines. This question, though, includes something else. Mary Baker Eddy asks, can there be any birth or death for man, the spiritual image and likeness of God? Remember our number four? It never had a birthday, did it? It's an idea. It just is. It doesn't have a starting day. If you don't have a starting day, if you don't have a birth, it's impossible to have a death. You cannot have one. And that's, that's how it works for the number four. That's an idea. You and I are infinitely more complicated than a number, as I mentioned. But we, too, are the ideas of God. 
Ideas of God don't get starting days either. We don't get a, a beginning day. We just are. Now, that's not just a pretty philosophy. It's practical. Jesus, I'm sure, was aware of this. I remember reading about an occasion when he was in a boat on one side of the Sea of Galilee, and then the Bible describes how the boat and everybody in it, including Jesus, were immediately on the other side. I remember I was in high school and I read that, and I thought, wow, that's a speed record that could only be tied that so fast, immediately. And I thought about it, you know, Jesus understood, he recognized that he's the idea of God. If God is ever present, if the number four, that idea, is ever present, would it be out of line to say that you, as idea, are not constricted by time or space either? As idea, are you ever present? Well, you know, I'm sure Jesus realized some aspect of that because being immediately on the other side, it wasn't like he was on one place and then in the other. He recognized he was on both places and in every place in between in that lake. Yes, as the idea of God, you're completely non-material. Non you're just not constricted by the measurements of time and space. Now, I know we're only about 10 minutes into this, and look, look what I've done to you. <laughs> I've taken away your birthday. I've taken away your mom and dad. You know, I love my parents. I love my parents, but I, exist, I existed long before I met them. You know, what we're discussing tonight was very important to Jesus. He took what we're discussing very seriously. In fact, I think if he walked into this room and heard this discussion, he would be very pleased. This, uh, I'm going to give you a little quote of his that relates to what we're talking about. And I know it will raise your eyebrows. You think you know Jesus? Listen to this quote. This is his words out of Luke. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. My goodness. Here, this is the Jesus we know as the most loving individual. And he says, if, if you don't hate your family members and your own life also, you cannot be my disciples. What in the world do you think he meant by that? Usually when you're in a room like this in a church and there's someone standing up here, you're not allowed to talk, but tonight you can. What do you think he meant? <laughs> Why would he say that? Was he, does he want us to hate our family members? Of course not. What do you think he meant? Anybody? There you go. That idea, the human version, the idea of having an origin, an origin in matter. And, you know, he could have just said, oh no, uh, God is your creator. He could have just said that, but he did it in a very dramatic way. He says, you need to reject the whole idea of a origin in the human version, in people. Thank you. In people. That is the beginning of your freedom from time, to recognize your origin. You see, if you believe someone has had a birth into matter, you're going to be terrified that person's going to die out of matter. It doesn't matter what you do. A start into matter means a death out of it. Well, God loves you all way too much to create you using some substance he doesn't know. The substance he knows is his own thought, and that's why each one of us here are the thoughts of God. In this book, Science and Health, Mary Baker Eddy, she says, she explains that God creates all forms of reality. His thoughts are spiritual realities. You and I, we're the ideas, the thoughts of God, here and now. Could there be any birth or death 
for the idea of God. No, that's you. I think a lot of people believe that, sure, we start out spiritually, then we become material for a while, and then return someday to being spiritual. Uh Uh-uh. No. The Bible explains none can stay his hand. If God created you spiritually, it turns out that you just remain the thought of God, the idea of God. That is the beginning of your freedom from the whole time thing. Now, Jesus, you heard there, said it in a pretty dramatic way that you have your origin only in God. He said something else in a more simple way. He said, call no man your father. Call no man your father. He said that in Matthew. All right. Again, picture if Jesus walked in here and he gave us that instruction. He said to each one of us, you know what? You have your origin in God, so call no man your father. Jesus, he wouldn't, he wouldn't give us an assignment that we couldn't do. And if he says, call no man your father, we're willing. Okay, fine. Yes, we love our parents. They gave us so much, they just didn't create us. That's all. We each exist as the ideas, the thoughts of God. In Science and Health, Mary Baker Eddy, she explains, in in speaking of Jesus, we have no record of his calling any man by the name of Father. He recognized Spirit, God, as the only creator, and therefore the Father of us all. Boy, I like that. The only creator, the Father of us all. Now, Would you imagine ever the idea of this spirit who is divine love aging, aging? Now, before you answer, I know that often God is depicted in other ways, sometimes anthropomorphically, you know, the man with the very long beard. And that man... If that was God, I certainly could picture God aging. That would be very easy. And if God can age, then I would be able to so also too. But no, God is completely non-material, and it is important to keep that clear. Think of this ever-present divine love and spirit that is God. Could you put a beard on divine love? You couldn't. You just couldn't do it. And so, could you attach mortality to God's creation? Isn't it wonderful that you're actually spiritual now, here and now? It's not something you have to die into. It's not some future state you may attain. No, today, here and now, you're the thought of God. That's how much God loves you. Now, when... uh, I was out of college. I was a baseball player, played in college too. And um, there was a particular pitcher that I read about, a particular pitcher who, I know he pitched here in Houston. I never got to face him, but he pitched longer than any pitcher has, has ever pitched before or since. He pitched a very long time. His name was Satchel Page. Did you ever hear of that guy? Did anyone here ever see him pitch? No? I was in Florida the other day. Three hands went up. Had seen him pitch. Well, this man, because he pitched so many decades, reporters were always bringing this up, bringing up his age and how long he had pitched. And I know he just got tired of it. One day, a reporter asked that same old question about his age. And Mr. Page, he responded with a question of his own. He asked the reporter, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you was, was his answer. Now, he may not have had the best English, but you know what? I just love how he was not going to be restricted, held down by someone else's idea of aging. He just wasn't going to do it, and obviously, he never did it. He just blew right through all the limitations associated with age. 
And when I read about that, it, it made me think too. You know, now that we know we're ideas of God, we don't have any more age than the number four does. <laughs> the world out there isn't going to like it. They're going to want us to be an age, just like it was for Mr. Page. They're going to want us to take on an age. And that's an interesting question. I mean, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you was? <laughs> that's an interesting question. Let's do a little exercise. Sometimes people, they have either consciously or unconsciously thought about a, an age when they think they'll pass away, some age. If you've never thought of that number or a number like that, just pick the number. I'll do the same thing. Don't tell me what it is. All right. Take that number and add 20 years to that. Okay? All right. Take that number and add 20 more years. All right. Now take that sum and add 50 more years. Wow. Let's go all the way to Methuselah's record in the Bible. How about 969 years? How does that feel? Mm. In the Bible, there's a, <clears throat> there's a line that I just love. I think about it all the time. It says, right in 1 John, it says, God hath given to us eternal life. God hath given to us eternal life. Now, eternal life. The first time I, I heard about that, I didn't understand it really at all. Eternity. I remember sometimes my parents would pick me up after baseball practice. They'd pick me up in their car, and I had stayed late usually doing extra work. And as I opened up the back door to get in, my mother would turn around and look at me and say, Mark, we have been waiting for you for eternity. And so I thought eternity was just a really long time. <laughs> Turns out that eternity is a lot better than that. God hath given to us eternal life, the Bible says. That's a lot better than 969 years. Eternity actually means without time altogether. It's where you take time completely out of the equation. Eternity is timelessness. So God loves you so much that God has given you an eternal life, a timeless life. All right, that's a whole lot better than a lot of time. What God has given each of us, what God gives us is just, just a single moment. A single moment, that's all we get. And that moment, is right now. That's all it is. It's the nowness of being. From this, <coughs> from this desk on Sundays, read every Sunday, the end of the service, is a, a quote from the Bible. It says, now are we the sons of God. That includes all of us, sons and daughters. Now, that's what it means. In this eternity, in this nowness, what are we? The sons and daughters of God. You don't have to age into that. You can't age out of it because there's only this moment. There's only now. You can see how this would be true for the number four. The number four is completely unaffected by the idea of time. And that's all it is. It's an idea. We, too, are unaffected by time. We are eternal. We have an eternal life. Now, I think probably in most places you go, people will admit that there is one God. If you go into this room, sometimes you'll hear from, read from this, this desk, that there's one mind. The idea, or the, the name mind, is used simultaneously for God. It's a synonym. Now, what about this word life? That, too, is employed in science and health as a name for God. L-I-F-E, life. Mind, life, soul, 
love, each of these words I've been telling you about are all descriptive names for this one God. They're capitalized in this book. Now, not a whole lot of people are going to say to you, sure, there's one God. Would, there, would it be accurate, though, to say that there's only one life? If God is life, and God is one, then life is one. There is only a single life. Again, when I first heard that, I didn't understand it. I, I learned it in Sunday school. I heard my teacher say it. And um, I didn't believe her because I'd heard other adults say, Mark, be careful. You could lose your life. You better protect your life. Things like that. So I thought, sure, God is life. But then I have my own little separate life, a life that I need to protect somehow. At least that's what the adults say. Well, it turns out that the first commandment is intact. It's true. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no other life before me. See, God didn't give you life. God is your life. There's a huge difference. God hath given to you eternal life, the Bible says. We each are living out from the life that is divine, that is God. It's the only life available. It's the only life you're going to get. How many here have ever worried about God, about the life of God? Never. As I was driving over here today, I drove by a, a cemetery, a graveyard. Down here, do you guys call them cemeteries or graveyards? Either? Yeah. Well, I looked over and I thought to myself, you know, on the stones there are dates. And I thought, look at all the typos. <laughs> it describes this one life, the only life we have, committing a birth into matter. And then a death out of it. And the dates are right there. There's only one life, and it's never died. It's the only life we'll ever get. And so, to embrace your eternal life, it's to embrace a gift. Now, if somebody wrapped up a present for you, wrapped a present, put ribbons around it, had a tag with your name on it, and you... You took the present without opening it and put it on a shelf in your closet. It wouldn't do a whole lot of good for you. You'd have to open it up and start to use it. And that is exactly, I think, what God expects us to do with this wonderful life we have. It's a gift that we open it up. Now, in the Bible, related to this idea that God has given to you an eternal life, it says that we are to lay hold on eternal life. Now, that's a very... A very wonderful quote. We are to lay hold on it. Picture that gift again. <clears throat> Somebody hands you a gift. It's got your name on the tag. Your hand, you have it in your hands. Someone else tries to grab it from you. What are you going to do? You're going to lay hold on it. You're not going to let anybody take it. Well, <clears throat> that's very important for us to do here. It's to lay hold on our knowledge, our awareness of eternal life. I, I work hard at doing that. I don't want my awareness of God as life to be some kind of a Sunday thing or a, a church thing or just a Bible thing. I want it to be something that I internalize. I walk around with all the time, conscious that I am living out from this wonderful life that is spirit and love. I want to make it practical. I want to make it real no matter what I'm doing. And so I need to lay hold on my eternal life. It's not like we have to lay hold on God. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about laying hold on your knowledge of it. You remember we heard Satchel Page. He was not going to be conditioned by the world. The world was not going to tell him that he was going to be limited by time. He laid hold on what he knew he was. Now that's just what I'm talking about. We've got to lay hold on eternal life. The world out there isn't going to like it. The world out there knows you were given a birth certificate. And on that birth certificate is a date, your name. It looks so official. And it re you might actually believe 
that you, ex you existed only beginning on that day. You could. I don't think you would now. Well, as official as those birth certificates are, we, we just let them go and embrace the fact that God is our life now, in this one single moment. We lay hold on it. I don't care what the world says. I don't care. I mentioned I was a baseball player. Sometimes <coughs> our team would go and we'd play at other fields. You know how when the Astros go and play in other, on, on other fields, go play the Cubs or something like that? The, um, we would do that same thing. And I knew that when we were the visiting team on somebody else's field, that most of the people in the stadium, they were rooting for their team to win, not for my team to win. You know, I'm the visiting team. And I knew, I was an infielder, and I knew that during the game, if there happened to be a pop fly over by the stands, where I could hear everybody right over there, as I'm waiting for the ball to come down, I might hear people in the stands yell at me. They might yell, miss it, miss it, look out for the bicycle, whatever they could to distract me. Now, I knew, you know, they didn't mean any harm. If they buy a ticket, they can yell anything they want. But I knew, I was prepared before the game. I knew that might happen. And I also knew that it wouldn't matter if everyone in the entire stadium were yelling, miss it. That would have no effect on the path of the ball or my glove. The only way it could have an effect is if I stop thinking about my business and start thinking about what they're thinking about. That's all malpractice is. And so I prepared. I knew I, I was going to lay hold on what I knew about catching fly balls. Now, in this big stadium called Our World, instead of hearing miss it, you will hear, I know you've already heard it probably three or four times this week just on TV, reasons that you have an age and how you're supposed to suffer as a result of whatever that age may be. You may. And the only way, it doesn't matter if every television on the planet is broadcasting that, the only way it would have an effect is if you stopped laying a hold on your eternal life and started thinking about what they're thinking about. Again, the truth isn't true by vote. If God is your life, nothing can change that. You know Jesus knew that about himself. He knew he could not be touched. And that is the same with you and me. And we have to be mentally tough about that. I'm, laid, I'm going to lay hold each day on eternal life. Because I know <clears throat> sometimes people will say to me, Oh, Mark, you must be this, you're this age, so this must be hard for you. Something like that. I'm loving to them, I'm nice, but you know I'm not going to go for that. One time I was talking with a, a group like this, it was on a completely different subject, and it was a long time ago. And a woman came up to me afterwards, and she said, Mr. Swinney, how old are you? I just can't place you. Now I hugged her. She didn't mean any harm. But there it is, that idea of, of you being an age. And you got to lay a hold on the facts, on the truth. You know, sometimes, though, this idea of aging doesn't come from the crowd all around us. Sometimes we hear it in our own thought. We hear ourselves think, well, no wonder I can't see so well, I'm this age. No wonder I can't run this fast, I'm that age. Things like that. I want you to know this. If it were only you and me on this planet, you would never have that thought. What you're hearing is just the thoughts of the world about that subject, just like static on a television, just the thoughts of the world of it. When you hear some thought like that in your own, in your own head, you, when you hear something like that, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. Even Jesus had those kinds of thoughts come to him. His response, get thee behind me. He's going to lay hold on the truth. He knows it, and he's not going to let anyone take it, take it away from him. He's laying hold on it. And that's something we each do too. We lay hold on it. You have to watch that conditioning. 
You know, I'll tell you, if you did choose an age, if you did choose an age, you would choose the wrong one. You never can choose the right one. There are problems associated with every number. I tell you, not too long ago, I was in Japan, and I was talking with a, a crowd about this, this very same topic. And I told the, the, the crowd about something that happens in North America. We were talking about picking the right age. And I told them about the terrible twos, the terrible twos. And they were very curious about this. They'd never heard of it. And I explained to them, you know, what happens when someone's two and how they behave badly. And they thought that was the funniest thing. <laughs> they were so surprised. They never heard anything like that. And it made me wonder. You know, I thought, you know, we condition those two-year-olds. The two-year-olds hear adults whisper, well, he's two years old. He's going to be terrible. And they're so happy to comply. <laughs> They're conditioned. They're conditioned into suffering as a result of an age. Taking on an age like that, no. You've got to lay hold on eternal life. That conditioning is important. I've mentioned it a few times. Let me, let me get into it a little bit more now. I read not too long ago, a few years ago now, about some, uh, the way some trainers will train baby elephants. It's very cruel. It's very sad. What some of these trainers do is um, in order to kind of confine the elephant, do something very cruel. See, an elephant, even when it's a baby, is much stronger than a person. So what they do is they first drive a heavy metal stake down into the ground, attach a big chain to the stake, and then manacle the, the chain to his back leg sometimes all legs. And they all watch the, the baby elephant struggle. It's very sad. And then finally, they're waiting for a time where the baby stops struggling. I think the elephants need prayers too. Well, at that point, when the baby starts, stops tugging against the chain, from that point forward, it's conditioned to, to, uh, to believe that whenever it feels something around its back leg, it's trapped. So, from that point forward, even with adults elephant, adult elephants that have been um, conditioned this way, all that's required to keep them in place is just a light wooden stick driven into the ground, a thin line tied around the back leg of the elephant. The elephant feels that, and he is conditioned. He thinks he's trapped. Obviously, he could walk away at any point. Now, we can learn something from that. Just as that elephant was free to go, he believed he was tied to that line, that he was, he was trapped, but he was free to go. Sometimes we also may be conditioned. We may be conditioned to believe that we are trapped on a timeline, on a timeline, that this timeline has somehow been tied to the idea of God that is you and me. No, we are completely free to go. No. I don't think any of you ever will think of yourself as aging in any way. You're not tied to any kind of a timeline. If you read a little more in this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, you'll notice a word that Mary Baker Eddy employs quite a bit, and it's a helpful idea. It's the word reflection. Reflection. Now, she uses this term in relation to kind of a of an analogy helps you understand your nature as, as God's offspring. Reflection. We've all looked into a mirror, and we notice that our reflection does exactly what we do. Looks just like us. It moves when we move, exactly that way. Well, that's a good way to help people understand, introduce the idea of being the offspring of God, that we're actually God's reflections, each one of us. We're the reflections of God. Now, that's interesting to think about, isn't it? If you've never heard that idea before, it does make you think. It relates to what we're thinking about now in regards to eternal life. Reflection. If you're God's reflection, then that means everything about you is derived. It's derived from God. It's God's nature, God's essence that shows in you as God's reflection. 
Now, I think as God's reflections here in this room tonight, let's make a promise to one another. I'll promise you. As God's reflection, as God, if I'm God's reflection, if you're God's reflection, I promise you that if God, if God ages, if God ages, I promise you I will do it too. I'm his reflection. I have no choice. If God does not age, and if God is not aging right now, how possibly could you reflect it? How could that happen? It's impossible. You need to lay hold on this truth. It's the fact, and it is practical. It is something that you can bring alive in your everyday life. I'm working so hard to do that. You know, sometimes, in order for me to help, help me to, to understand this ageless nature God has given me, what I do, instead of just thinking of myself as ageless, I start this way. I start thinking about other people. If I behold the ageless nature of God in other people, then it's easier for me to do it for myself. Try that this coming week. As you're at the store or whatever you're doing, just look around. Each one of the people around you is an individualized expression of this love that is spirit. As you behold that, you'll be very grateful, feels good, and then you'll recognize it in yourself more easily. Try this, experiment with that. So interesting. You know, you don't have to know much about this topic to have it really come alive. In fact, just an introduction to it can make a huge difference. I was reading not too long ago about a man who traveled all the way to New England to go hear Mary Baker Eddy uh, speak. He was visiting one of his friends, and that was the main reason for his trip. He traveled all the way out there, and um, when he got there, he asked, you know, Mary Baker Eddy, I know she lives in this part of the world. If she's speaking, would it be possible to go see her? Well, his friend looked at him and thought, how in the world are they going to get there? See, this man had to take the train all the way to Massachusetts, and it was hard for him to move because he walked with two canes, and he'd walked that way for a very long time. Well, they walked over to a hall where Mary Baker Eddy was speaking, and about 10 minutes into the program, somebody mentioned to him, here comes Mary Baker Eddy, and she walked right in. He listened to what she had to say, and then he and his friend went back home to their apartment, that little brownstone kind of thing in Massachusetts. Well, they were talking about what they heard, and then the tourist, he stopped, and he looked in his hands, and he said, my canes, my canes. He'd been healed there in hearing that talk, and he'd left his canes at the, at the hall. Now, you all know a lot more about eternal life than he did. You know, you've learned a lot more about it. He just heard a little bit about it, and that was his first introduction. And it just goes to show, it just takes a little knowledge. Just lived that makes such a difference. And oh, I work hard to do that. You know, when you, when you are feeling the way you live out from eternal life, even if you do it for just 10, 15 seconds at a time, throw confetti in the air. You caught yourself doing it right. That's a good way to do it. I mentioned I was a baseball player. Baseball players, they do that a lot. They don't always talk about what they do wrong. You don't really get too far too fast. You gotta know what you're doing wrong, but mostly you think about what you did right. And as you do that, you grow so much more quickly. You gain faster. Try it. When you are doing it, even if it's three seconds, and you feel your agelessness, that you're off the timeline, you're not tied to anything like that, rejoice. You're doing it right. Have you ever heard that phrase, the prime of life? The prime of life? You ever hear that before? Prime of life. 
If God is life, and God is your life, would it be accurate to say that you are in the prime of life? Yeah, you are. You're in the prime of life because God is your life. Nothing's going to ever take that from you. You know what? When I was growing up, I went to a church out in California. It looked a lot like this, except that it was two stories. So we had the Sunday school down, downstairs. And when Sunday school was over, I would usually walk up the stairs, and I'd go out there in the entrance area and try to find my parents. Time to go home. Well, there was a, a woman there who often would call my name. This woman was a friend of mine. She was a, a Christian science practitioner. That's someone who devotes his or her full professional time to praying with other people. And she was so nice. She'd bend over and she'd say, Mark, come over and see me this week. Well, she lived a long way from my house and I had to ride my bike against the wind to go see her, but she was so nice, I couldn't say no. And so I'd go see her a lot, I'd go see her. And let me tell you, this idea of the prime of life was something that was more than just a philosophy to her. It was something she embodied. She just loved that idea. And that's what she'd talk with me about often. She'd talk about how God is her life. We talk about other things too. I remember once her telling me about the way she saw the, the smoke and flames from the fires after the 1906 earthquake. I remember her telling me about that. Well, a few years later, one day I got a telephone call from one of her children. Now I say children, her children were way past retirement age. And her son called me up and he, uh, he said, Mark, could you come over to my mom's house? She is, looks like she's dying today and maybe you could make her more comfortable, something like that. By that point, I had a car, so I drove my car over. I remember parking it in the driveway. I opened up the door, walked up the front steps, knocked on the door, and that same man answered it. And I walked in the living room, and he was there with his brother and sister, and they were sitting there in the living room, and I could tell they were, they were talking about who was gonna get what. <laughs> I didn't like that too much, so I walked over into my friend's room and, uh, oh, it was hard. She was unconscious lying there on the bed. And you know, I told you how much I love her. I really like this person. And it was hard for me to see. I was kind of overcome by the whole thing. I knew that wasn't going to help her. So finally I walked over and I sat by a chair next to her bed. And I started to pray. I prayed. I prayed by listening. I didn't do any talking. I just listened to God. I just prayed. And I remember God answering my prayer. And I felt such love, the love of God, along with the answer. God said to me, he said, Mark, in the in, in, in this context of that scene, this would be something God would say. He said, Mark, be aware. Well, I'll never forget it. God, he said, Mark, be aware. I am the only presence. I'm the only life, God is saying. In every corner of the universe and in every corner of thought, I'm the only presence. I'm the only life. God said it with such love. I was not expecting that. Oh, but I just let it wash in. I looked over at my friend. She was gone. She'd stopped breathing. But I was very interested now in what God was revealing to me. I was surprised, I was so glad. Mark, be aware, God said it. God said, I am the only life, I'm the only presence in every zone, every corner of the universe, every corner of thought, I'm it. Oh, I could feel it now. I looked over at my friend and she came back. And we started talking. We talked for a long time. And she continued on for many more years with her job as Christian science practitioner. Again, to be in the prime of life was not just pretty words. It was something that she felt. 
She knew it. I think, like I said, if Jesus walked in this room, the fact that God is his life, that would be a main element of his message. And he would be so pleased that we are taking it so seriously. If God is life, and it's the only life we have, then it's worth it to live out from this wonderful spirit that is love. We're in the prime of life. We are. There isn't any time. We cannot be conditioned by the world into thinking that we have a life separate from God. No. We each are the self-expression of divine life, of God. We're the reflection of life. God's reflection. Think about that. When you're at the stoplight on your way home, you're just a reflection of God. That is your status. And what a status that is. I remember when uh, I think I was in junior high. One time my father was given tickets to go see an American entertainer, a man that I'd heard of, but I'd never seen except for on TV. Uh, he got two tickets, so he brought me with him. And it was in a big theater. The entertainer's name was Jimmy Durante. Do you ever hear of that guy? Jimmy Durante, he's the guy with the big schnozola. Remember that? Well, uh, this man had, been, had entertained for many, many decades. And um, I remember when he was introduced, he ran down the aisle, jumped up on the stage, and I laughed at his jokes just along with the rest of the crowd. And then there came a point in the show where he, he sang a song, a song he was pretty well known for. This song was called, is called Young at Heart. Did you ever hear that song before, Young at Heart? Well, I tell you, I'll never forget hearing him sing that song live. If you go onto YouTube and type in Jimmy Durante, Young at Heart, you'll find that song. I looked it up the other day. It's something to hear. He doesn't have the best voice, but I'll tell you, when he sang that song, he wasn't just entertaining us. He was singing his theme song. His theme song. Young at Heart. See, he, he understood that youth wasn't a a product of, of matter, time, or a body. It was something in your heart, something in your thought. And that's kind of what we've been talking about here tonight. That we lay hold on our eternal life, young at heart. Would that be our theme song too? Well, sure. Of course it is. We're, we're, our youth is in this nowness of eternity. And that's something that is not just intellectual, it's in our heart. It's something we know, we feel. Now, here we've talked an hour about this topic. If you happen to pick up one of these books on the way out, one of these copies of Science and Health, you'll see a whole lot more about life, eternal life, agelessness, your spiritual nature. If you don't have a copy, get one on the way out. And I want you to know, this is not some sort of substitute Bible for Christian scientists. If you read through it, you'll, you'll notice right from the start that it's Jesus' life, Jesus' example, Jesus' words. It's not only the foundation for the science of Christianity, it's the whole structure of, the, of, of Christian science and healing. And so, Take a look at this, and if you want to, go online, learn a little bit about the author, Mary Baker Eddy. A good website is the Mary Baker Eddy Library. It's a good place to go look. Well, we've come a very long way, haven't we? Look how far we've come. It's been an education. I've learned too. Don't you just love the idea that your origin wasn't in people? Your origin is here in God. You don't have to die to become spiritual. It's, it's with you right now. Suppose before this lecture started, before any of you arrived, I installed little buttons on the, uh, what's that called, the things on the sides of your chair? Armrest. armrest. I usually don't say this part, and so I forgot armrest. What if I installed little buttons there? And if you press the button on your armrest, 
you ascend. How many here would press the button? A few of you. You don't have to press the button. You're completely spiritual today, now. You're as dead as you're ever going to be. <laughs> it's true. You are the offspring of God. And you've got to laugh about it sometimes. You don't have to do a thing to remain the offspring of God, at one with God, showing forth the nature, the essence of God, as I've mentioned. Now, you could go to California and you might visit a, creos or a, a, a pine tree that is 4,775 years old. There's a creosote bush just a few miles from there that is 11,700 years old. Or you could travel to New Mexico and visit our bacillus spores that are 250 million years old. <laughs> but you know what? Those numbers now you can see are nothing compared to the eternal life that you've been given. It's so good to know about it now, isn't it? You know how in the 23rd Psalm it says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know that one. That relates to something else in the Bible. It says to lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on it, and then finally, God is thy life and the length of thy days. God is thy life. There it is in black and white. So this is not a new idea. It's just one that's going to be new for us now. God is thy life at the length of thy days. The 23rd Psalm makes a whole lot more sense now. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in my life forever. Would that, that's more than just a poem now, isn't it? Oh, I can feel the meaning of it. Would you mind, let's just finish up. Let's say it together. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, if that's how the 23rd Psalm ends, that's how we're going to end here tonight, too. We're all done. That's all.